Now, what is basically biological oxidation? Let's start with it. Now, you know that we take food in different forms. For example, we intake carbohydrate, lipids, and proteins. However, the form that we take in the food cannot be utilized in the body to serve the chemical reactions that takes place in the body because the chemical reactions and the enzymatic actions in our body requires energy in the form of ATP. So, we are required to convert this food that we intake into a suitable form of energy which can be utilized by the body, that is ATP. And this is achieved via oxidation process. And as it's taking place in a organism, cellular organisms, we are naming it as a biological oxidation. Now, in order to have a better understanding of this chapter, it is very essential to know some basics as well. For example, we need to know what is bio. We need to know what is bioenergetics. So basically, bioenergetics refers to any kind of energy changes that takes place during a chemical reaction. That is, it deals with the initial and as well as the final state of the energy during a chemical reaction. So in simpler term, basically, it deals with whether a chemical reaction will take place or not. That is, whether a chemical reaction is feasible or it's not feasible. That is what the bioenergetics will mainly deal with. Now, the food that we intake, ultimately, needs to be metabolized in order to be utilized. Now, this process of metabolism, if you see this diagram, is consists of three stages. The first stage is called the stage of hydrolysis. That is where we take the food components, which are large actually, are required to be broken down into simplest form. For example, carbohydrates are required to be broken down into glucose, lipids into fatty acid and glycerol, proteins into amino acids. And this stage will be known as stage of hydrolysis. The second stage of metabolism is called stage of preparatory stage. During these processes, the simplest form that we already gain through hydrolysis will go through several metabolic reactions and will generate few ATPs. Remember, the amount of ATP generated during these processes are very minute. The last stage is called the oxidative stage. Now, this is the stage where the materials that we have gained already or formed already will go through a series of electron flow, that is, or go through a series of chain of electron flow through from one enzyme to another enzyme. And during uh, this process, oxidation will also take place. And this is the stage where the maximum or the major portion of the ATPs are synthesized or generated. If you see this diagram, you will have a better understanding of the stages of metabolism. Let's take the examples of the carbohydrate, for example. Now, carbohydrates are broken down into glucose, that is the stage of hydrolysis, and as it occurs in both anaerobic and anaerobic organisms, it enters into a stage known as glycolysis, which converts the glucose into pyruvate. Now, as it converts into pyruvate, it generates ATP. But keep in mind, the ATP that is generated are very minute, that is very less amount of ATP. Second, this pyruvate is ultimately converted into acetyl coenzyme so that it can enter our Krebs cycle or also known as the TSA cycle to form intermediary compounds. And this is known as your pre stage, basically. And again, during this process also, the amount of ATP generated is very minute. At last, the products that are produced from Krebs cycle enters to electron transport chain, where the electrons will flow from one enzyme to another enzyme and will release water and ATP. And the ATP produced during this stage are the maximum amount of ATPs. Next, this is the definition. We need to know the definition of biological oxidation. So basically, these are oxidation processes that are taking place in non-living organisms. That's why we're calling them biological oxidation. 
it basically involves series of enzymatic reactions that will break down your carbohydrate fats and amino acids that you have taken in in the form of food into water and into ATP the energy form that we have please remember during this process another process also takes place simultaneously that is during biological oxidation or elephant transport chain the other process that takes place simultaneously is called oxidative phosphorylation now both of these processes are act as a couple in oxidative phosphorylation what will happen is that the adenosine diphosphate or ADP will combine with phosphate high energy phosphate to form the ATP as I have already mentioned we need ATP in, as a form of energy in order to be utilized so both of these processes takes place simultaneously or as a couple if you see this diagram you may have a better understanding so how is ATP generated as you see here electrons flows through series of enzyme complexes and ultimately will release energy in the form of ATP and as well as water now ATPs can be generated via two mechanisms one of them is called substrate level phosphorylation the other one is called oxidative phosphorylation the main differences between these two mechanisms is that in oxidative phosphorylation it is essential to take the help of the electron transport chain whereas in substrate level phosphorylation we do not need the help of electron transport chain rather we use the energy from the substrate to join the ADP with the phosphate to form ATP if you see if you see this example here PEP plus ADP is generating pyruvate and ATP so the energy for this reaction is obtained from your substrate that is your PEP and it's an example of substrate level phosphorylation moving on the next important key point it's very essential to know that what enzymes and coenzymes are involved in the process of biological oxidation the enzymes that we have in biological oxidations are collectively known as oxidative reductases and under this umbrella of enzymes there are four groups of enzymes that appear number one oxidases number two dehydrogenases number three hydroperoxidases and number four oxygenases at the same time we have four sets of coenzymes these are nad plus nadp plus fmn and fad now as I have already mentioned that the process of biological oxidation and oxidative phosphorylation will be a coupling process that is they will work simultaneously as a couple so it is very essential to know that where is this process taking place and where are the electron transport chain located where are these enzymes where are these coenzymes so the location of these enzymes and coenzymes or collectively the electron transport chain is in the mitochondria to be more precise it's in the inner membrane of the mitochondria now you may ask why mitochondria number one mitochondria has specialized structures which appear as folding called crista or kisti so so what these crista or kisti increases the surface area and hence they make any processes much more efficient so the ATP synthesis will be much more efficient due to this increased surface area that's why mitochondria is the suitable location now this is a very common question please do remember it's asked in all type of examination the location for the electron transport chain so again I'm repeating it's the inner membrane of the mitochondria where these reactions will mainly takes place moving on next important key points are the components of the ETC so what do we have so we have already seen that the main contents 
are the enzymes and the coenzymes. These these enzymes and the coenzymes are organized in a very sophisticated manner. That is, they are arranged as complexes. In total, there are five complexes in an electron transport chain and two electron carriers. Number one, complex one, is co consists of NADH ubiquinone oxidoreductase. Complex 2 is consists of succinate dehydrogenases. Complex 3 is consists of ubiquinol cytochrome oxidoreductase. Complex 4 consists of cytochrome oxidase. Complex 5. The other name of complex 5 is ATP synthetase. This is the one that will be responsible for your ATP synthesis. So other than these five complexes, we also have two electron carriers, which are known as coenzyme Q and cytochrome C. As you, as you can see here, they are very sophisticatedly arranged, these complexes and the electron carriers. Please, it is advised that in the main PPT or PowerPoint lecture, you go through in details about these enzymes and the coenzymes and these complexes. You should be knowing all of their features, their characteristics in details. Now, let's discuss about the electron transport chains in details. So, whatever the food steps, foodstuffs that we are taking in, ultimately the end results of these intakes causes formation of NADH and FADH2. This NADH and FADH2 goes through electron transport chain where it gets oxidized by several reactions and ultimately releases its electrons to the oxygen which is known as also as the terminal electron acceptor. So if oxygen is present then the ETC or electron transport change will convert these NADH and FADH to ultimately into high energy compound known as ATP by the process of oxidative phosphorylation. Now, if you see this diagram, you will have a better understanding of the electron transport chain. As you can see here, we have already learned that the electron transport chain is mainly consists of five complexes, that is enzyme complexes and two coenzymes. So we have complex one here, complex two, complex three, complex four, and the complex five. If you remember, the complex five was also known as ATP synthetase. We also have two coenzymes, as you can see in this image, one of them is called the coenzyme Q, the other one is known as cytochrome C. Both of these are also known as mobile electron carrier. That's because they can move around the electron transport chain, unlike the other complexes that you have seen, which are in fixed position. You should also remember that the location of the electron transport chain was in the inner membrane of the mitochondria, which is a very important point to be remembered. So, when in the mitochondrial matrix we have NADH and FADH2 which enters via any means, they will go through this process of oxidation ultimately to release the ATP. But we have also learned that NADH cannot enter directly into the mitochondrial matrix because the mitochondrial matrix is impermeable. And we have also will also learn that how it enters by the special subtle systems. But before proceeding on with the detailed process of electron transport chain, we should first remember that how NADH and FADH2s are produced basically. So if you remember, the process of glycolysis ultimately give rise to or give causes formation of 2-NADH. The process of Krebs cycles or TCA cycle give rise to 2-FADH2 molecule and 6-NADH molecule. So now when the NADH first when it comes near the complex 1, it gets oxidized into NAD plus. 
by the help of the enzyme called dehydrogenase, NADH dehydrogenase. At the same time as it gets oxidized, a molecule here known as flavomonoprotein, uh, or also known as flavin maybe, this one gets reduced. So FMN gets reduced into FMN2. So here, at first, the NADH is getting oxidized to NAD+, losing its electrons. And who is excited these electrons? Inside complex 1, we have FMN, which gets reduced to FMNH2 by accepting the electrons which is given by the NADH. Now, the FMNH2, the electrons which it has, will be taken by this coenzyme Q. And as the coenzyme Q takes these enzymes, it gets reduced into a reduced form of coenzyme Q. Now, this coenzyme Q will then transfer the electrons to the next component of the electron transport chain. But, but before we proceed with it, let's also understand that how do FADH2 also gets oxidized. So the main distinction is that the NADH will start its oxidation process from complex 1, whereas FADH2, it starts its oxidation from the complex 3. So it basically misses out or avoids this complex 1. Now this is one of the reasons why each NADH molecule can give rise to 3 ATP molecule, whereas each FADH2 molecule can only give rise to 2 ATP molecule. Why? That's because they are missing out the complex 1, the oxidation that is taking place in complex 1. Just like in complex 1, how NADH got oxidized to NAD+, the FADH2 in complex 3 will get oxidized into FAD. And as a result, the flavin molecules that we have inside of the complex 3, known as FMN, get similarly reduced into FMNH2. So basically, my bad, I have done a mistake here. FADH2 will not enter through the complex 3, but through complex 2 here. So they will just avoid complex 1. So that's why FADH2 are giving only rise to two ATP molecules, whereas NADH is giving rise to three of the ATP molecules. Now, let's come back to the coenzyme Q, which also have another name called ubiquinin. The coenzyme Q, which received the electron from this FMN2, is already in a reduced form. Now, what they can do is that they can transfer it to the another coenzyme Q, okay, which is their duty, they will transfer the electrons to the another coenzyme Q. Similarly, when FADH2 gets oxidized here into FAD, so inside we have also another flavor protein known as, as you can see, we are calling it FMN, which gets reduced to FMNH2. So as, as they get reduced, and the electrons from FNM, FMNH2 can also be transferred into this coenzyme Q. So as we already mentioned, it's a mobile coenzyme, it's a mobile electron carrier. It can move around and transfer it to the other coenzymes that we have already there. So these coenzyme Qs, they will transfer the electrons to the complex that we have, the complex 3. As you see here, complex 3, then it will, the complex 3 that we have are mainly made up of the, mainly made up of iron groups and all. So as it passes the electrons, it will cause oxidation in these complexes and it itself will get reduced back to its, uh, sorry, it, it, it will, uh, it still gets oxidized into its original form. So the complex C basically is consists of a pigment like uh, uh, material called cytochrome B <clears throat> and it will have iron in both sides of it. So when the coenzyme Q transfers the electron, the iron that we have in this side is called Fa3+. It gets reduced uh, to Fa2+, and the Q enzyme gets oxidized to its original form. 
Now from complex 3 again, the electrons that we have will be shifted or transferred into complex 4. Complex 4 is consists of the pigment like material called cytochrome C. So again, the cytochrome C will get oxidized and ultimately, they, in the presence of oxygen, they will release water and energy in the form of ATP, which will be seen. Now, our inner mitochondrial membrane is also known as selectively permeable. That is, it allows certain materials to enter and act as a barrier to certain materials. You should be knowing which materials can pass through and which cannot pass through. So our mitochondrial membrane is permeable to pyruvate, glucose, succinate, alpha-ketoglutarate, malate, but impermeable to hydrogen ions, NADH, NADPH, oxaloacetate. So now this creates a problem because during the process of, for example, glycolysis, Krebs cycle and so on, we generate large amount of NADH, oxaloacetate. So it is essential for these materials to enter the mitochondria in order to be utilized and to be produced ATP. So how to do so? So for this reason, so for, so for this reason, nature has given us something known as the shuttle system, which will cause these materials to bypass the membrane and enter the mitochondria. So we have two shuttle system. One of them is called glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle. The other one is called mallet aspartate shuttle. The glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle includes the enzyme glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenates, which are found in the cytoplasm. They convert the NADH, which is which cannot enter through the membrane, into NAD plus. Similarly, we have malate aspartate shuttle, the oxaloacetate that is found during in the cytosol cannot enter the mitochondrial membrane, so they are ultimately oxidized into malate so that they can enter. So both of these shuttle systems is allowing these materials to bypass the membrane so that we can utilize them. Okay. The next important points are the inhibitors of electron transport chain. So there are various materials that can block the flow of electrons through the electron transport chain and thereby may prevent the ATP synthesis. These electron transport chain inhibitors can include any material that may particularly block a particular specific complexes. For example, drugs such as barbiturates may block complex 1, certain antibiotics may com block complex 3, toxic materials like cyanide may block complex 4. Whatever complexes they block, they will interfere with the flow of electrons and hence they will interfere with the ATP synthesis. So in summary, the process of oxidative phosphorylation will include the flow of electrons through the chain, which will ultimately cause the complexes to pump out hydrogen ions or protons into the mitochondrial intermembrane space. As hydrogen ions and protons are pumped out, an electrochemical proton gradient is created. This causes the hydrogen ions or protons to be pushed back into the mitochondrial matrix. And as they push back, what they do is that during pushing back, they cause rotation of complex 5 or ATP synthetase. And as the ATP synthetase or complex 5 rotates, it generates ATP. Now let's discuss how the ATPs are usually generated in details. We have already learned that ATP is formed by the union of ADP with the phosphate or more precisely high energy phosphate. When they combine together the ADP and the phosphate they generate ATP. <coughs> we have also learned that the ATP synthesis mainly takes place in the complex 5 or also known as ATP synthetase. Now usually our ATP synthetase is mainly made up of two subunits known as F1 and FO. The F1 and FO collectively makes the structure of the ATP synthetase. The structure
picture somewhat looks like this. As you can see here, we have a F1 unit, which are made up of several subunits, alpha, beta, gamma, epsilon, and so on. And this usually project outwards. And the FO subunits, which usually spans the whole mitochondrial membrane. Together, the FO and the F1 are connected by a stock, as you see here. The one more major difference between them are is that the F1 is water insoluble, whereas the F1 subunit is water soluble. Okay, now the F1 is named F1 because the O stands for oligomycin which has the ability to inhibit this FO subunit. The FO subunit is mainly made up of four polypeptide chains. The F1 subunit is made up of nine polypeptide chains, three alpha, three beta, one gamma, one delta, and one epsilon. Now, let's see how does this ATP synthesis takes place. If you remember, we have learned that the complexes in the electron transport chain will transfer electron from one to another. And as it does that, it causes the hydrogen ion to be pushed out into the inner membrane space that creates an electrochemical gradient and causes the hydrogen ions to be pushed backwards. Now, as the hydrogen ion pushed backwards, it somewhat and somehow causes rotation of the gamma unit of the F1 unit. And as the gamma unit rotates, it causes the beta units to change its conformational shape. And as the shape changes, it allows ADP and the phosphate to bind with the beta subunit. And hence causes production of the ATP. And due to these findings that how ATP generated, the Paul Boyer, the scientist who proposed it first, even won the Nobel Prize. If you want to know more details about these mechanisms, please go through the original PowerPoint slide lecture. Just like we have inhibitors for electron transport chains, we also have inhibitors for oxidative phosphorylation. These inhibitors of oxidative phosphorylation are more precisely known as uncouplers. If you remember, in the beginning of the lecture, I told you that the process of biological oxidation or, and oxidative phosphorylation occurs simultaneously as a couple. So if anything, any material, if they want to interfere with these procedures, they need to separate them or uncouple them. That's why we are referring them as uncouplers. Examples of uncouplers include 2,4-dinitrophenol or naturally occurring uncouplers such as thermogenin or thyroxine and so on. So basically, how does these uncouplers work? They will prevent the formation of this electron chemical cation. So there will be no hydrogen ions pumped out in the inner membrane space of the mitochondria. If there is no electrochemical gradient, there won't be any hydrogen ion pushed back into the matrix of the mitochondria. If there is no hydrogen ion pushed back, so there will be no rotation of complex 5 or ATP synthetase. If there is no rotation, then there will be no ATP. That is how mainly these uncouplers work. Other than those uncouplers, we also have other groups of inhibitors such as oligomycin and atracyclocyte. They also can inhibit the process of oxidative phosphorylation. Our last important key points are the clinical aspect of this lecture. There are individuals who can inherit certain genes which may cause defects in the process of electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation. So individual with inherited disorder may have the particular diseases like lethal infantile mitochondrial ophthalmoplegia, bioclonic epilepsies 
and so on. You can you can see the typical features of each of these inherited disorder and their defects. For example, Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy will have defect in complex one. The individuals will show features like blindness, cardiac conduction defects. Leg syndrome will also have defect in complex one. Patient will have movement disorder and so on. So in today's online lecture, I mainly focused on the key points of this chapter. So as it's not possible to complete each and every slide in details. However, each individual slide is of utmost importance. So it is advised, please go through the whole lecture PPT, which is consists of 180 slides and more. I'm again repeating 180 slides and more, which will be provided to you as a supplementary material. And if you have any confusion regarding it, we can discuss it. You can ask me question about it. Thank you.